Welcome to the Going Beyond podcast. My name is Sasha Bozio, and with me today is Peter Hirsch from Kettlebell Movement. And we're going to talk about how to build superhuman strength. Welcome, Peter. How are you? I'm doing well, Sasha. How are you? I'm doing great, doing great, enjoying the rain in San Diego and uh, cooling down a bit. It's very nice. It's very nice that it's starting to cool down here. It's been very hot the last few days. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So uh, welcome to the show. Thanks for making the time. I know you've been busy with uh, shooting a lot of videos and teaching people how to become strong and uh, playing with the kettlebell. And uh-huh. uh, we'd love to hear more about that today. But um, before we go into too much detail, tell uh, us who is Peter Hirsch and sell, share some of your story. Okay. Um, well, I, uh, as far as my fitness career, I started off actually with a, uh, with a big gym chain um, and uh, enjoyed it. I, I actually did have a good experience for the most part. Um, I definitely learned a lot. Um, and eventually decided that it was time for me to uh, just do my own thing because I, I wanted to follow my own rules, and that's the kind of person I am. And so uh, I started doing my own practice and um, constantly uh, just learning uh, as much as I possibly could. Uh, I, I just felt like I, I had an obligation to, to the people that I was teaching to be able to teach them the, the very best information that was out there. So um, I, I just am constantly learning, uh, which for me is a, a mental game as well as a physical game. So I'm, I'm constantly practicing and studying and trying to find balance with everything else in my life, just like everybody else. Um, and yeah, now I, I still have my private practice where I teach uh, functional movement and, and holistic health as well as my online business, which is kettlebellmovement.com, um, which is a free resource for people who would like to just learn how to live as healthy as they possibly can, be as strong as they possibly can, and also connect with a community uh, of people who are like-minded. That's great. That's great. Mm-hmm. So tell us, what got you into the direction of kettlebells coming from natural gym training and doing all kinds of free weights, I guess, and machines? So what made you decide to choose the kettlebell and really focus on, on that specific tool as, as your main focus? Well, it's an interesting question. And it actually, um, in, in reality, Sasha, I'd say that, that, that uh, I really don't. <laughs> um, even though obviously my website is kettlebell movement and if, and if you, most people would consider me to be a kettlebell trainer, which is absolutely correct. Um, but you know, kettlebell training really, um, it's, it's a, it, an interesting term. You wouldn't use the term dumbbell training or barbell training, uh, in the same way that you would use the term kettlebell training. Um, but really uh, you, we have to look at it that way is, is that there's not a lot of difference between, um, that, that concept of, of, are we really kettlebell training? Well, what we're doing is we're doing um, we're doing strong person. What I like to refer to as strong person training, um, which has been performed for a very very long time, centuries, uh, using all different types of tools. And the kettlebell is one of my primary tools because it is extremely versatile and it is able to do things that barbells and dumbbells cannot do, and it is also able to do most of the things that barbells and dumbbells can do. But with that said, obviously, um, dumbbells and barbells are also great. Body weight exercise is also one of the key elements to my teaching. And perfecting your body weight movements uh, along with any other type of weightlifting, I think is also extremely important. So, mm-hmm. so kettlebell training as a term, it's not something I necessarily object to because it is used so widely and it does point to something that's pretty conclusive. Uh, I would say I'm not a kettlebell trainer. I'm, I'm a functional strength trainer and the kettlebell is by far one of the most versatile and useful tools within that spectrum okay. so uh, to speak that that makes sense so that's basically something that's very simple you need to buy our your whole home gym it's something you can take with you and maybe one or two kettlebells do a lot for you i guess right and that's, that's exactly it and, and one thing that you asked me was coming from a, a conventional training method or or seeing all of the machinery that they have in most gyms and and um that obviously uh does bring into 
account a whole different element of training, um, which is is not a full body way of training. And it's also, as you're bringing up, it's not simple. Uh, it requires a lot of equipment and it, it compartmentalizes the body, which is something that I, I wouldn't do regardless of the tool that I was using. I would never, um, I, I wouldn't recommend to somebody to train uh, their muscle as opposed to their movement unless they had a specific goal for a specific reason that was compelling them to do so. So that's, that's, from, so that's my understanding. That means that the kettlebell movement and the functional exercise really strengthens your entire body from your hips, from your toes to your head and to your arms and to your legs and whatnot. It's not like, okay, I want to have a big biceps. Uh, then I would have to go to a machine and build that huge biceps that I want, which is okay, I guess, right? Exactly. But um, the kettlebell is then something that really trains like yoga on a different uh, level, your entire body. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, a lot of people actually come to me after they work with me, uh, sometimes just for a single class. And they, uh, I've heard very many times somebody say that it's like yoga with weights. <laughs> and, yeah. and a lot of times it really is. And then other people I've said that to and they look at me like I'm insane. Um, but it's funny that other people have come up to me and said that uh, completely independently of anything else they've heard me say. Um, but it, it is um, very much like yoga with weights. And, and the way that your body would move in the real world um, is, is big muscles to small muscles. Uh, and if you've ever seen a pitcher, for example, pitching a, a, a fastball at 102 miles an hour, we know he's not using his biceps to throw that ball. And we know that's a fact because he doesn't have huge biceps. But you can see a huge whipping action that happens in his body. And it starts with his core muscles. He also uses those glutes and hamstrings, big powerful leg muscles, and then goes from all of the big muscle groups. And a whipping action occurs all the way down to those smallest muscles. And that's what kettlebell training does. And that's what most real world movement does is it uses your muscle groups from big to small. So you go from core and then you build outwards from there. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. So who are some of the people you learn from and uh, you're inspired by? So I yeah, know we talked a lot about it, but I think you have some specific people that you want to mention. Yeah, I, um, I've, I, I've definitely I study from a lot of people. I really want to, um, I, I don't want to get involved with any dogma or any specific thing that must be right because this person says so. Um, one of my mentors actually makes that very clear. So, so um, one of the biggest influences in my career has been a gentleman by the name of Paul Check, mm -hmm. who is one of the preeminent holistic health teachers in the in the world. Really, he's, he's world renowned. Um, and while he he um, I have not spent a lot of time studying m much of his movement philosophy or, or as much specifically um, his overall general concepts of health have had more of an impact on my teaching and also my lifestyle than almost anybody else. Um, other people such as Pavel Satsulin, um, who is well known to be the person that brought kettlebells to America. Um, has been a huge influence, especially when it comes to more of the weightlifting and movement aspects of things. Um, disciples of his, such as Anthony DeLuglio, I spent a lot of time studying from those guys. Um, and also from uh, other kettlebell trainers that have different philosophies, such as uh, Valieri Fedorenko, who does more of the, the competition-style training. Um, he's a very, very smart guy. He's got a lot of uh, great information. Um, and uh, even Steve Cotter. Uh, they, there's just a lot of guys. And, and again, I think that's the main thing for me is, is I definitely want to um, learn from as many people as I possibly can because um, sometimes there's a difference between the two that neither one of them is necessarily correct or incorrect, uh, just a different way of doing the same thing uh, that may be more beneficial for one person than another. Uh, and that's really what it comes down to is there's no such thing as a cookie-cutter solution for health. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's a good view, I think, in these days where everyone wants to have a six-pack in six weeks. I think that approach is way more um, sustainable, in my opinion. So Absolutely. I really like that approach. So um, share with our readers something that only new few, only a few people actually know about you before we get more into the details of um, well, superhuman strength and how to become a resilient person. Sure, sure. Well, um, I guess the one thing I don't really talk about very much is, is uh, I spent the last um, approximately 20 years of my life studying uh, Buddhism to a great degree. Um, it's been something that has really helped me to see things um, with uh, less 
uh, judgment and also be more patient with the world around me. Um, and while I say that I've studied Buddhism for a long time, um, the, the interesting thing about that is that what I've really come to understand about myself is that I, I actually shy away from any type of ism and uh, an, an ist. So I'm, I'm not really an ist of any type of ism within, within my general <laughs> concept anyway. Um, but um, I do believe there's, there, there's different benefits um, to every different concept that there is out there. Um, but I think that the most important thing is that um, we realize that change is, is pretty much the most constant thing that we have. And that's, that's where I shy away from isms because they, they have a tendency to prohibit change. And, and if I was to prescribe to any specific ism, uh, it would be changeism. I love that. That's, that's <laughs> lovely. Yeah. Changeism. Yes, I'm yeah. a changeist. Yes, yeah. and I, I'm sure there's other much more. Well, I think the Buddhists. The used. Buddhists also say a good Buddhist is a Buddhist that changes. You know. Yeah, and exactly. That's, and that's, you know, ism is might not even be the right word, but um, I exactly. have a similar background, and I think we always talk about if you're open to change and uh, embrace like things are uh, you know changing all the time which is of course not easy because we always strive for consistency which is not possible then you um, you know then maybe you have a happier life exactly yeah i do agree great great yeah. so um, you know i'm coming from the perspective of a lot of people that work in the office i'm myself like very dedicated to work with my mind work um, train my mind be mindful and aware but also have actually a fit and healthy body and what i realized over the last 20 years uh, being like a a computer worker so to say which most of us are these days uh, like office rats you could say uh, that i uh, have created kind of a flatline work style so i think uh, I realized, I mean, before I started to train and before I got into the kettlebell training, that I almost uh, performed on a flatline of work style. I got up, had some tea or had some coffee, ate some breakfast, drove to work, and then I sat at work uh, from 9 o'clock till 5 o'clock. And the, the most exciting thing for my nervous system I did was up, walk up and down the stairs so got, get some coffee or work for, walk for lunch. Mm -hmm. So, and I think, uh, of course, we become more and more aware of those um, problems that this creates, that we actually have hard time responding to stress. I'd love to hear your opinion of how kettlebell training or the, maybe the functional um, movement training that you do can help us to uh, create a very resilient nervous system and also a, a, a very useful stress response. Okay, yeah. So um, there's two two points to bring up uh, uh, almost uh, about the two different questions. Um, the The nervous system... Uh, thinking on it, and, and it's so true about the stress response from the nervous system and how that plays uh, such a, a subtle um, but impactful role throughout your day. Um, and and my, my teaching and my belief is, and this doesn't, it, it's irrelevant what kind of exercise, what kind of physical activity you're engaged into, um, it should be um, as much of a uh, an exercise for your nervous system as it is for your physical body. And, and kettlebell training definitely does that for lots of reasons. Um, but there is certain activities that you can do that do not necessarily provide that same stimulus. Um, other such activities that do provide it what might be yoga, like we talked about, or, or dance, martial arts, things like that, um, they share in, in common with kettlebell training and any type of, of strong person training. The, the fact that you have to use your, your brain and you have to consistently focus and allow your nervous system to adapt to a given movement in order to gain strength. Um, whereas a lot of people, what they're trying to do is gain strength out of building more muscle. And, and while building muscle uh, will help you to become stronger, the building of the muscle is actually the byproduct of the practice. The, the practice is, is a mind-body practice where you're, you're engaging your nervous system and programming it um, and teaching it new capabilities or you're teaching actually your nervous system how to use the body that it already is 
the master of. So, so one analogy that I use frequently is imagine that if, if you stepped into a Formula One car, and today, Sasha, if you stepped into a, a Formula One car, and I know you're a German, oh, yeah. so you're, you're probably a wonderful driver because you, you've taken the German driver's test, I which is very difficult. I paid $3,000 to get the license yeah, in Germany. Yeah, so I know that's not the same as the license they take over here. So you're probably a wonderful driver, but if I put you behind the, the wheel of a Formula One car, you would probably be able to get about 20% of its potential uh, driving around a track. In fact, you might just wreck the dang thing. Yeah. But, but we know that you wouldn't be able to, to maximize your potential. So what your nervous system is, is it's not the Formula One car, it's the driver. And, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to teach you, or, or what kettlebell training and, and a lot of these other arts have in common, is that they teach you how to use that vehicle that's already sitting there ready to go. The, the overwhelming majority of people do not have the motor skills and the, the range of motion and the flexibility, which instantly comes from your nervous system just to be able to function in their daily lives, let alone go to a gym and function. Mm. So, so that's, that's the aspect of the, of, of using that nervous system, uh, throughout your exercise. Uh, it has to be something that you're very focused on the entire time. And then what we look at as stress or what you, you know, we were, you think about stress and a lot of people, um, they really see stress as being a bad thing. They, see, they, they have a negative connotation with the word stress. And actually stress uh, it should actually come with a positive connotation. We should think of stress as a positive thing for your body um, because as we know, no organism is going to survive without various types of stress. Um, your, our, our very interaction today on um, verbal communication is, is a social stress. Um, the sunlight is a type of stress. Even my, my dietary intake is a form of stress, um, as well as my physical exercise. They're all forms of stress. And, and as long as there is a, a sufficient amount of recovery, then that stress is going to be a beneficial thing for my body. So, so that's what we have to look at is, is um we have to, I think, change our mindset on what stress actually is and see stress as being a potential positive. Now, um, something that let's say that I were to uh, spend all day in the office and I'm slouched over a computer and I'm, I'm receiving those various stresses from the light, from my monitor, from my poor posture, um, from people interacting with me, phones ringing, noises going off all the time, and I'm receiving that stress, receiving that stress all day long, um, there may be a, an amount of recovery that is required to, to recover from that stress that's far greater than I will actually receive. And therefore, I will not recover from that stress from that office. Another way to look at it is, is also this, is, is that eight to 10 hours of doing that is probably going beyond stress and, and putting your body into a state of what I refer to as distress. Mm -hmm. Distress mm -hmm. is the state of taking stress to the point where it is no longer a benefit, no matter how much recovery you get. And, and I think that that's the thing that we, people need to avoid distress, but they need to learn how to embrace stress, balance stress, and also get the appropriate amount of recovery uh, once they've put stress onto their body for whatever reason. So basically that flatliner work style of not working is creating more stress than it would have if I take half an hour and, and do something that gets my heart rate going or uh, something that really engages my body in a certain extent, which then is a positive stress response, which creates in reverse a, a more resilient um, lifestyle or, or, or body. It, it, it absolutely does, as long as you are getting the appropriate amount of recovery and, and, and other factors in your life would also have to, to be met as far as uh, your nutritional needs and, and uh, even your, your mental and emotional needs would also be, need to be met. Um, but once those things are met, then absolutely, you will, you will increase your capacity to sit at that desk for four hours if you are doing something that is stressful to your body in another way and recovering completely from that stress, especially, um, you know, physical exercise. So that means you have to basically find a balance. You have to find a balance between physical activity, sitting activity, and, and not just do one thing for eight or 10 hours at a time. That's not healthy to anyone. From well, that's exactly it. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's exactly it, Sasha. That yeah, and, and, the, and the other thing too to remember is that, that your solution and, and whoever listens, the, the individual listening to each conversation 
their solution is going to be unique to them. It's it's it, th- if they try to mimic my patterns, that may not work out best for them. If they how do they find patterns, how do they find a good solution for themselves? That's a good question. And and honestly, what it comes down to, Sasha, is the ability to observe oneself. You know, really, that's what it comes down to. You have to study your. You have to observe your own body. You have to see how your body responds um, after certain stressors have been placed upon it. And also after you've recovered, you have to see how your body is responding to that recovery. And and you have to also be very prepared to listen to very subtle cues that your body might be giving you as to um, what's going to be happening in the long term if you continue that activity, good or bad. Um, so so ultimately, uh, what it comes down to is, is, is that is the aspect of health where where it's, a, uh, in my opinion, a very good thing. That's the part where you take matters into your own hands 100 percent. And um, listening to your own body is uh, your ability to listen to your own body is to a large degree going to be the regulator of your overall health. So that's the basically more- the foundation and basis. And I mean, as you know, I'm promoting meditation and mindfulness training a lot and I'm doing it myself for over 20 years. And so I see that people out in this world are like completely stuffing their brain with too much information. You know, if you look out there, the average American consumes about 70 gigabytes of data, which is the equivalent of 150,000 words a day. So how can you be in tune with your body and feeling what's going on or actually accepting or being aware what's going on and making a good decision of what do you put in your face or in your mouth? Uh, how, How long are you going to work or however you behave? If you are overwhelmed by all this information and uh, basically almost incapacitated to to listen to yourself, so exactly, I almost yeah. feel like that what you're saying is like that training your mind or start simple breathing practice or laying on the floor and connecting with each body part, like doing a body scan, what people do, might yeah. be even come first before you uh, jump and, and and pick up a uh, a huge exercise regime. Without question, it does, and then even even. In the transition there, you you will be um, moving from a, a mindfulness exercise in your body to um, potentially just very simple movements, um, body weighted movements before you progress up to even lifting anything that weighs anything. Um, but that's entirely correct. There is no there is no um, there is no foundation to your house that you will ever build that will be too strong. Yeah, you know, so so there is no degree of of mindfulness that will ever be detrimental to you in any way um so though that's that's exactly correct that makes sense so i I think that's that's a good a good take on that so now i mean what's really exciting about you and your new program i know kettlebell movement is taken off and uh, you have a lot of followers there and i think a lot of people appreciate the great and off most of the free advice that you're offering um you are working on a program that's called building superhuman strength and Mm -hmm. I, i i i take it with a little humor because it sounds awesome but it also sounds like a huge promise. And uh, I know you've thought about it and I know there's something substantial behind it, but I'd love to hear what that is about. Certainly, yeah. Um, well, how to build superhuman strength. So this is, um, you know, our, our goal with Kettlebell Movement has always been to teach people how to move properly and be functionally as capable as they could possibly be, um, knowing that, it, hey, you know, if you're trying to reshape your body, if you focus on the process, then those things will happen very quickly for you. But our, our main goal is not appearance. Our main goal is to to, perf- to perform. And, e- and even for some people, that, that word performance, it doesn't necessarily mean out on the track or, or in your favorite sport. It, it could be playing with your grandchildren. Um, for a 65-year-old person, performance might be able to just pick grandkids up over your head. Um, so, so that's our, our goal with Kettlebell Movement is to help people to perform at their potential, uh, whatever potential that might be. So the, the term building superhuman strength um, is, is a title that um, came to me uh, after I had already um, put, put together the program, at least to a large degree I'd already put it together, because it seemed like the most obvious name to give it. Um, it, so it wasn't it wasn't like I came up with this name and tried to build a program <laughs> around it. You know, it was the other way around. And the reason that that happened was because I looked at the program and I looked at the progressions that we were doing. And what occurred to me was that um, for for so many people, they spend so much time doing types of exercises that while they are difficult, they don't necessarily 
bring all of the components of strength into play. Um, so, for example, if I can bench press uh, 400 pounds, well, good for me, um, but that doesn't require me to have really any um, motor pattern awareness. It doesn't really require me to have much range of motion at all. It doesn't require me to be able to stabilize through my core while I'm trying to stand. There's no balance. There's no stability and things like that. So, what we're building uh, through this program is every single layer of strength. And as a result, what happens is you will end up moving your body and moving objects in a way that you would think to be otherwise impossible. In fact, we'll go so far as to say that you'll end up moving objects and your own body and stabilizing and, and lifting in a way and performing in a way that um, people with, with what appear to be twice your muscle mass would never be able to do. Wow. Um, and that's, that's really what it comes down to is because, you know, like I said, the, the real strength doesn't come from having massive muscles. And, and not to say that muscles, obviously, they do play a part in being strong. Um, but the ability, uh, again, we go back to that Formula One car. Um, you know, most people are driving around in a Formula One car and they've never driven anything beyond, you know, a Toyota Corolla uh, with an automatic transmission. So that's how fast they're driving that Formula One car. And so when they actually learn how to utilize that vehicle that's already there, it seems like they've reached a superhuman goal when, when really all I did was just teach them to use their um, potential. So and maximizing your own potential is the goal that, of this. That is exactly what it is, maximizing your potential, whatever that might be for you. And the way that I've done it is I've structured it into tiers um, where the first tier is um, very, very simple motor, motor patterns, learning how to lift with your legs and not with your back, um, helping you to understand the areas of your body that might be lacking in flexibility that will prohibit you from being able to, to move in the most efficient ways possible and addressing that flexibility to help you do that. As we move up in the tiers, you find that the exercises progress to be more and more challenging. So for some people, they might find that they start out on tier one and they stay there for weeks, maybe even a, a couple of months before they move on to tier two. Uh, for other people, they might have been already practicing with kettlebells for a long time and another type of functional exercise. And they might take tier one uh, for uh, a few days observe the material, take it under consideration, practice a few of the things, and be ready to move on to Tier 2 and Tier 3 very, very quickly, um, all the way up to Tier 8. So this is an eight-tier program um, where they will be really maximizing their potential uh, when they get up to that level. So anyone can do that program and participate because you have different levels or how is it structured? That, that's the idea is to allow, um, I mean, first of all, I should preface this whole thing by saying I am very much against cookie cutter programs. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we see so many people going into group classes for training and for exercise. Um, you know, one person in that class is, is uh, an athlete and has been doing that, that art for, for years. And then somebody else is brand new and they're all trying to do the same workout. And that's completely inappropriate. And so even within what, what I'm doing, we still have that to some degree. But, but what I'm trying to do is make it as customizable as possible so the person who, that is listening to their body is able to say, okay, I, I'm ready to move up to tier two um, and and, and we're turning a cookie cutter program into something that is as customizable as it could possibly be mm. without having somebody actually sitting there in your living room telling you what would be best for you at this time. So. And people can do this online. Is that something that they can participate online or how, uh, how does someone become part of that? Um, well, it's, it hasn't launched yet. The program has not launched okay. and it will be through a series of videos that will be available to stream live or stream online. Um, so you can do that anywhere you want in your in your gym at home, in your anywhere you have Wi-Fi. And we're also going to try to make those videos available to somebody if they were in a spot that did not have Wi-Fi. We actually released a program a few months ago that was a smaller program that uh, we were able to make it so that anybody didn't have Wi-Fi was able to still bring those workouts with them. That's great. Um, so, so it's going to be as basically you are going to see me go through every exercise that I will be asking you to go through. 
And um, although you may be doing them slightly differently as your body is going to be different than mine, um, but we will discuss those variations and we'll, we'll embrace them and not shy away from them. Um, but yes, it will be available online and it will be also available if you don't have Wi-Fi at your gym or anything like that. We'll make it so that you can access those workouts uh, wherever you go. So the best way of connecting basically is go to your website and sign up for your newsletter or to your Facebook page and people will then be notified when the program launches. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. If you if you go to my website, kettlebellmovement.com and you join the movement, um, what you'll be doing is you'll be signing up for our newsletter and uh, we will email you our newsletter and also our program when it comes out. And we also promise not to spam you with anything other than information that is high quality information. Right. Well, so. one thing I want to I wanna ask you, I forgot actually to ask you before. Um, I know that you are very much focused on the exercise part, then, but you mentioned also that you're very holistic. You have a very holistic viewpoint. Mm -hmm. And I know that you have a lot of um, knowledge about food and diet and stuff like that. And I know people are starting changing their diet. There's more and more information what's healthy for us and what's not so healthy for us. And I, I'd love to hear from you uh, any advice for our listeners of how someone can actually integrate a healthy diet into their um, exercise and stress routine and whatever they do in order to really perform at their fullest. Okay. Well, it's, it's a question that I could probably spend the next day <laughs> <laughs> answering. So I'll try to be as, as, as brief as possible um, while giving you the, the right answers. Um, first of all, your, your, again, your solution is going to be unique to yourself. And, and that doesn't just mean um, to fit into your own lifestyle. Um, as far as, oh, I don't have much time, so I'm going to cook things that don't take very long to cook. Well, that's fine. You can find healthy solutions that don't take very long. Um, that's very, very easy to do. Um, but your, your solution would be very unique to yourself uh, when it comes to nutrition also because the types of foods that work for you may not work for me and they, they may not work for somebody else. And, and that's, again, what we talked about, that regulator of your health being your ability to observe your own body. Um, hey, you know, when I, I used to eat bread uh, and I didn't stop eating grain until about 15 years ago. Uh, so I, I ate grain for 20 plus years of my life and I never noticed anything wrong with it. I never noticed a problem. Um, I'll tell you what, now if I put a piece of bread in my mouth, I'd almost immediately noticed that my, my tongue was going a little bit numb sen sensation. Uh, I'd feel a tingling sensation on the inside of my mouth. And within 10 or 15 minutes, I've ha I'd have an acid indigestion. Um, the reason I would notice that now is because I'm much more in tune with my body and also because I've eliminated things from my diet so that when you bring them back in, it's obvious. You, you simply go through an elimination process, you reintroduce something, and then you immediately notice any of the negative effects that those foods might be having on you. Those foods might be completely different for you than they are for me. So you may be able to eat bananas all day long, and, and if I eat one banana, I have indigestion and, my, uh, and I get gas pains from it. So um, the, the main thing with your diet is you have to really go into your own body. You have to uh, – I recommend an elimination diet for most people at the beginning um, and then introduce foods slowly back into your diet and see how those various foods – affect your body, uh, eating them one at a time, introducing just one thing at a time and taking the time to observe your body uh, as you have consumed them and after and how does it respond in the next few hours or the next day after you've eaten that food. So so that's the main thing is, is that um, for some people, um, a high protein, high fat diet with very little carbohydrates might keep them feeling high energy all day long. Um, but the chances are if your ancestors were from a very hot air, tropical region region of the planet, um, you might be more, um, you might find more abundance in more of the sugary starchy foods, um, the things that grew all year round in tropical regions uh, that ancestors in polar regions would not have had access to. So, so that's a very unique thing. And, and once you've embraced that, that's the, the first step. Um, I would say quality of your food is the most, is one of the most important things in any way. Um, I, I really think that, you know, right now we've got a, a food supply that is very questionable as far as the quality. And I think that uh, it is extreme in its lack of quality. And therefore, in order to have quality in your diet, sometimes you need to do things that other people might perceive as being extreme. For example. Um, although, <laughs> although I don't I don't think they are extreme. Um, for example, um, 
you know, you go into a grocery store and you say, oh, I, I, I can't buy any of this meat because there's nothing here that's grass fed. Uh, there's nothing here that's that's been raised in a pasture. This is all feedlot commercial food. And, and I, I'm not going to ch- choose to consume that. And and um, if you go to a, a lot of restaurants, that means, hey, your friends are going to want to hang out, go to go out to food to food. And you're going to say, I'm sorry, I, I don't eat there. And then that might seem to some people to be extreme. Whereas to me, I would say, well, eating that type of food is extreme. Um, so it depends on how yeah, you look yeah, at things. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I would definitely um, really the quality of the food that you eat is as important as making those individual choices as to the types of foods that you put into your body um, and the foods that are right for you. And then the other thing, too, is this is, is just as, as something that I've seen over the past, you know, 15 years of training and, and hearing people, um, I don't want to say give excuses, but give reasons uh, as to, to why they aren't as healthy as they'd like to be. One of the most common things is, is I don't like to cook. And, and this is one of the very few times that in, in giving people advice that I, I give the uh, simple solution of suck it up. Um, if you don't like to cook, learn learn to enjoy it learn how to at least cook some basic things for you if you value your health and and very rarely do i have such a sort of a brash response to somebody who is struggling with an aspect of their life but when it comes to cooking it's one of those things that uh, if you don't take responsibility for the food that's going into your body, then who will? And and hey, you know what? If you have a spouse that's willing to cook extremely healthy foods for you, uh, three meals a day, then that's wonderful. Um, but that's probably not sustainable, yeah. and it's probably not the reality for most people. So so eat, like I say, if you don't love to cook, hey, that's one thing. Learn how to cook some basic things that you will take the time to cook and that are nutrient dense and and good for you and it, and you know what it doesn't have to be anything crazy um it's such an important thing and and um you wouldn't say oh i don't like breathing it's such a pain such a pain to have to breathe um so don't say the same thing about cooking it's yeah. it's it, it may be a pain um but you wouldn't hold your breath for the rest of your life so don't not cook for the rest well of it your goes life. back what you say goes back to the initial um um, exercise or the initial mindfulness and observance that you have to develop in order to also train properly, right? Absolutely. And again, that gets lost because we mindlessly go into the supermarket and buy any packaged foods because we're hungry and we have that sugar craving and we just stuff it in our face. I mean, that's, yes. that's what it is. So actually taking that moment and you were right, taking that breath and being a little bit more mindful and conscious of what we choose and how we feel and what we eat and how it, we feel two or three days later down the road, that's, that requires attention. And that requires yeah, attention that we might not be able to put towards Facebook and any other devices and any other social media that actually requires attention that looks inside ourselves. And it really I think does. that's what I'm always trying to, to really uh, force myself to do and also in conversations try to stimulate with other people because it's so hard to look inside yourself. It's so hard to see what's going on. And, uh, but that's actually the, the biggest, the biggest um, lever we have to change ourselves in terms of food, in terms of exercise. Yeah. Well, you know, when it comes to those things, there's actually a powerful motivational tool that I use um, for for finding for for making those decisions. Because, you know, Sasha, I go to the grocery store hungry sometimes, too. And, uh, you know, I have get the to, ice cream. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, and I go th- and, I, and I, I go to the grocery store and I and obviously uh, I try to shop at the most healthy places. But even the healthy food stores have foods that are not healthy for you. Um, and I. I make certain decisions um, while I'm in the store not to buy things that I know I would not need in my house. And and actually, one of the, the tools uh, that, that helps me is this. And we talked a little bit about kettlebell training at the beginning. And, and when I'm focusing solely on kettlebell training and developing my ability, I notice that the more food I eat, um, the more it makes me feel confident in my training. Um, on the other hand, uh, when I turn my kettlebell training or my functional training into body weight training, um, now all of a sudden it has a little paradigm shift, doesn't it? Because um, obviously if I'm eating, 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 and I'm trying to make improvements in my ability to use my body weight in training, um, I will not see those changes. Yeah, yeah. So so it actually helps. So, you, you know, we talk about kettlebell training, and that's one of the things that body weight training actually is, is really good for, in my opinion, is that if you get into the gym, forget about forget about food right now, just get into the gym and practice a pull-up or practice a push-up or, or, or if you're elite level, practice your, your pistol squats, whatever it is that's challenging for you, and then 
develop, spend the next hour trying to practice that movement or a few basic body weight movements. And then leave the gym and see if you're as likely to put some food into your body that you know is going to make that exercise more difficult the next day. It, it, it really does have a mental effect. The extra 10 pounds that you carry around. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So, so I think that going into the, that type of training, everybody gets motivated by exercise. And, and, and you should see people's faces light up when I have them you know, even do a, a deadlift of, of a weight that they never thought they'd be able to lift or, or even something more extreme like a snatch, something they never thought they'd be able to do. And so it's a very powerful motivational tool. And uh, body weight training can also be the same thing just to help you say, hey, you know what? I don't need to go to the grocery store hungry and buy a bunch of ice cream because that's not going to help me with my goals. Yeah. And I'm working hard for my goals. Yeah. Well, so we're coming towards the end of this podcast, and uh, I'd like to ask you one question that's uh, personal, or not personal, but very related to what I do. Mm -hmm. And the title of my blog is Going Beyond, so I always like to, I mean, you're my first interviewer, and I really thank you for that. I'm just starting uh -huh. doing that. Uh, the title of my blog is Going Beyond, and uh, I always like to ask you, or like the, the person that's interviewed, how do you go beyond? So what does Going Beyond actually mean for you? Yeah, great. Um, well, I think for me, what that means to me is, um, when I reflect back on my career, um, I, I learned uh, a very, what I would refer to as conventional uh, approach to teaching health to my clients. Um, I, I was taught specifically things like calories in, calories out, methodology to weight loss. That really didn't put much emphasis on the quality of the food or the, the, uh, the type of food you're eating. It was more about how much food you were eating. Um, and also a conventional approach to health in the respect that, as you mentioned, it was a lot of um, the, the teaching and the culture at the time, especially with the certification bodies for fitness trainers, did a lot of um, machine-based education. It was, it was a lot of showing people how to put their clients on a different machine to train their biceps, to train their legs, and to do those types of things. And so that was actually where my education started as a personal trainer uh, many, many years ago. And while I took all of that information into consideration and even to some degree taught it and used it in my own life, um, I felt like there was more and I did not want to necessarily just listen to one person. I wanted to get more information. Um, so so I went out and I, I studied varying viewpoints. And a lot of those varying viewpoints, Sasha, I I immediately discarded as as faddish or somebody trying to sell something, um, and and those are sometimes obvious when that happens. Um, but it was a matter. I think that I think that one thing that happens is that we have a tendency to attach ego to knowledge. Um, so once we once we gain a certain piece of information or a certain sc uh, school of thought on on a subject. We have a tendency to become egoic about it and then almost defend that information uh, as though we were defending our very lives if somebody comes along and tries to attack it. And I think that for the most part, um, it's really time for us to start talking to each other about what is right, whereas right now we have a tendency just to argue over who is right. Mm -hmm. And, and I think if we can get over that argument and we can start talking about what is right, then we don't get attached to the information. We, we can observe it objectively and we can also take on new information without a fear of it becoming um, a, a dogma for us. It, we can take it for what it is. And, and also, I think that we can also use science much more objectively, whereas now we see scientific studies being uh, funded by a company who has a financial interest in a specific result coming from that science. And, and then we get back into arguing over who is right and not trying to figure that's out right. what is right. And, and that's what we need to do. If we want to go beyond, if we want to be the best at whatever it is that we want to be the best at, however we serve humanity, if we want to be the best, we have to remove ourselves from that egoic attachment to our information that we have, and we need to constantly review other viewpoints and be objective about it when we do that and and i feel like that's that's one of the biggest downfalls that we have is the well, i like that it's what serves the most what serves the most people and not the most individual interests right exactly so that's I mean, that's beautiful yeah yeah so well, that's that's my belief i think we should always be going down i think we should always be looking for that that higher level of knowledge and um you know, especially if we are planning on being 
role models and influencing other people with that knowledge. So, Well, that's, that's a nice statement and a good statement to end that with. Thanks, well, Sasha. Thanks so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. I hope uh, everyone who listens got some good information out of it. You can find more about Peter Hirsch and Kettlebell Movement on the kettlebellmovement.com. And Peter, thanks. Uh, have a great day and uh, good luck with everything. Thanks a lot, Sasha. It was nice talking to you. Take care. Bye. All right. Have a nice day.